Okay, guys, welcome back to the R3S stage with a very interesting talk about ethical hackers and investigative journals. The question is, game over. And besides the most prominent names like Julian Assange or Edward Snowden, there are hundreds of thousands of courageous journalists and hackers out there who are being arrested, intimidated, or even killed. Simply because they expose the lies, the corruption, and the war crimes of the world. Stefania Morizzi, John Goetz, and Andy Muller Magun will enter an open discussion in the form of a crossover interview where they will talk about hackers and journalists' common history, the current state of things, and hopefully perspective by the, by the future. Welcome, folks, and thank you very much for joining us here. And um, the stage is yours. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks so much. Let me introduce myself and then we will, <clears throat> my Andy and uh, John will introduce their, themselves and their work. So I'm an Italian investigative journalist working for the Italian uh, daily Il Fatto Quotidiano and I was previously working for La Repubblica and L'Espresso. And the reason why I'm here is that in the last 11 years I have worked on uh, many um, releases of documents, uh, uh, Wikileaks documents mainly, but also the Snowden files and other <clears throat> documents which uh, fortunately were um, shared with, from, by ethical hackers, by activists and so on. So I have, uh, I have spent uh, more than a decade on this kind of work and uh, I'm here just to bring my experience on how it, important it is this uh, this kind of partnership with ethical hackers it was crucial and is still and is even more crucial it was crucial 10 years ago uh, very new and uh, is even more crucial in these days uh, because many things have changed and uh, the big tech and the importance of data and the importance of this um, community is more and more uh, more and more so. So let me let me explain you why I started doing this kind of work. Everything started in for me at least back in 2008 when one of my sources stopped talking to me as a journalist. She was convinced we were under illegal interception. And of course, there is no way to know whether you are under legal, illegal interception as a journalist and source. But my source was convinced we were under illegal interception. So she stopped talking to me. Uh, uh, she suddenly disappeared. And I have never known what she, she had. So whether she wanted to discuss something very important. I, never, I have never known what uh, was the, the matter she wanted to discuss with me. Anyway, uh, I was lucky to have this problem because I took it very seriously. Because uh, at, it was at that point when my source stopped talking to me that I decided, well, maybe I have to, uh, I have to look for more uh, effective way to protect my sources because the traditional way, the old fashioned ways to protect sources, which even in these days, many newsrooms and many journalists use uh, are no longer uh, suitable for, for this age of mass surveillance where you have these powerful microphones. You believe you are meeting with the source in full secrecy and uh, privacy but it's not uh, it's not like this and so i took very seriously my source and uh, her concern and it was at that point back in 2008 that i i told myself well maybe i should find a better way to protect my sources and uh, as a mathematician because i'm a mathematician before going to journalism, I took a degree in mathematics. For me, it was natural to look at 
cryptography as a tool to protect sources. I mean, I suppose if, if I was um, a lawyer, I could look at laws, a uh, kind of legal protection for sources. But I was a mathematician, so for me it was natural to look at mathematics, uh, cryptography as a tool to protect sources. So it was one of my sources inside the cryptography, uh, the expert of cryptography who put Wikileaks on my radar screen back in 2008 when very, very few people had even heard of Wikileaks because Wikileaks had been established just two years before. So very, uh, they had not published collateral murder or their big scoops. So my source put Wikileaks on my radar screen. And for me, it was very, very interesting for two reasons. First of all, because they were using encryption. And in those days, no newsroom was protecting sources on large scale as Wikileaks was doing using encryption, not even the New York Times. I'm not sure. I mean, 10 years later, many people don't remember how it was back then. But in those days, not even the New York Times had ever heard of things like uh, a submission platform, uh, encrypted communications with sources. So it was really new and really brilliant how they were using these advanced tools to protect journalistic sources and to try to, uh, to protect documents and to make them available to, to the public. So I was really attracted by their way of pioneering these skills. And it was my language, you know, it was, uh, even if as a um, graduate in maths, I just had theoretical knowledge of these things. So I never had to use uh, encryption in practical terms. I just knew the concepts. I just knew the, the uh, you know, the, the theory behind encryption. So I was not able to use it for practical reasons. And that's why I wanted to establish contacts with them, to learn from them. And because I like to learn new things and I like to, to learn how to use these tools. So back then, no one was using these tools and not even the New York Times. And they spent years before they were, they introduced full scale encryption, secure drops and so on. But in addition to this, there was another thing which, ma which made Wikileaks very attractive for me, and it was their courage. So when I realized that they had told no to the Pentagon, when they revealed basically the Guantanamo uh, standard procedure handbook, the, their manual, and I realized that there was an organization uh, saying no to the Pentagon. For me, I mean, it was really refreshing. It was really uh, something big because in those days, uh, it was the, those were the dark days where, you know, I'm not sure if you remember, but the New York Times was uh, basically uh, infamous for publishing their stories about the Iraq war. The New York Times was infamous for uh, uh, calling uh, torture as enhanced interrogations and so on. Um, or the Washington Post did not publish the full li the, the names of the countries where the CIA black sites were based, uh, the uh, Eastern European countries. So for me, it was something which was much needed. That was my first uh, approach to Wikileaks back in 2008. And of course, I started establishing the first contact. And for me, it was really, you know, it was really difficult. First of all, I was really skeptical at the very beginning because I had concern they might be, uh, you know, linked to the secret services. And I have, I'm very paranoid when it comes to the intelligence people. I realize I'm, I, I have, a, you know, a very, you know, kind of uh, skeptical uh, approach because I don't like the intelligence services. I don't, I have seen how they enroll people, for example, in the technical universities, in mathematics, physics, uh, uh, chemistry, and so on. So I have always been hostile to that kind of word. So at the beginning, their, um, their approach was, uh, 
uh, quite, uh, you know, I was very cautious. I was very careful about them. And I was trying to contact everyone who was in touch or even heard the WikiLeaks. And one night, they called me in the middle of the night. I still remember that first time they called me because I was sleeping and I could barely understand what, what was going on. They caught me in the middle of the night that they said, we are WikiLeaks. <laughs> and it was July, July 2009. It was very, very hot in Italy, something <laughs> terrible. And I was sleeping in the middle of the night. And they said, look, we are WikiLeaks. You should go to your computer and download the file. Uh, we would like uh, some help in order to understand uh, this audio file and try to understand whether the, it is genuine. It was an audio file in Italian, and it was about a well-known scandal, the garbage crisis in Naples. And so I wake up, I was really, I mean, I was sleeping, but basically I was sleeping, <laughs> and I ran to my computer and I downloaded the file, and it was an important file, actually. It was an important file about the alleged role of the U.S. of the Italian intelligence services. And I, I have done, I did some basic journalistic checks on this uh, file in order to establish whether this file was genuine, whether the facts were actually uh, correct. And we published. We published for the first time this. Um, uh, this uh, file, uh, the 6th of August 2009, which means well before the, the Af uh, Afghan war logs, uh, collateral murder, and so on. And, you know, since then, I never stopped working on these files. And for me, it was really, really important uh, because uh, I, I think I have learned so much from them. I have learned to deal with... Uh, with sources, with journalistic sources, and I realized, thanks to them, how naive I was in dealing with sources, how naive I was in um, in uh, my communications with sources. So I learned a lot from them. I learned uh, how to deal with these technologies, and uh, more than that, I even learned how to make. Uh, these documents are rele relevant for a large public because they have a different approach with respect to the with journalists. So I learn a lot from them. And uh, more than this, I learn even about technologies. J just to give you an example, in these days, we are all concerned about uh, Corona. And if you look at, uh, at the UK, at the United Kingdom, you can see how uh, the, um, slowly, this big tech is basically uh, is basically infiltrating, I would say, uh, the health services. They want their data. They want the uh, UK patients' data. And so you have this big tech, you have Google, you have Palantir, you have these companies which want to access the uh, health data of, of the UK patients. And, mm, Slow, little by little, they are doing this, getting contracts secretly, and there is uh, very little information about this, and probably they will be able to infiltrate the health service and getting it privatized. So they, uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I, my concern is that they, uh, little by little, they will lose the UK uh, citizen will lose control of their public uh, health system. And uh, one of the companies which is basically accessing the, their data is Palantir. And you have to realize that the first time I heard about Palantir was back in 2011, when uh, the Bank of America enrolled the Palantir company in order to neutralize WikiLeaks, because Julian Assange had promised to publish data about uh, Bank of America. So since then, I, um, this kind of work put Palantir on my radar screen. And I have, I have seen how they uh, basically evolved 
since then and how they got contracts with the CIA in Afghanistan, with the um, migrants, um, with the US authorities in order to stop migrants at the border. So it was only thanks to this kind of work with WikiLeaks on the Snowden files and so on, which uh, I gained this experience in dealing with these uh, tech companies, data analytics companies, for which I'm very grateful and which I believe it makes a difference for our work. And I believe that this work is more relevant than, um, than ever. And I believe it will become more and more relevant as we go ahead because these day, these, the whole matter is about uh, getting control of data, whether it is about uh, health, whether it is about wars, it's all about getting control of data, and so I believe this partnership will be more relevant than ever. So what they, what we could establish ten years ago and more, eleven years ago in my case, will be more and more relevant and strategic for journalism. Of course, there are pro there have been problems and all sorts of complexities in dealing with. I could tell you some anecdotes about whether when we were working on the files and John can add some anecdotes on this, uh, so how difficult it was to deal with people calling in the middle of the night, uh, uh, with people telling you you have to fly to a city and then in two hours they call you, no, you have to fly to another city and so on. Of course, it, it, it was also complicated and complex work but I think it was crucial and it has been crucial and it will be even more crucial as we go ahead with this kind of, of um, landscape where these data companies, governments and um, military organization are more and more interconnected. So we have to establish partnership with the ethical hackers and with the tech people who understand this, who understand the data who understand technologies, because uh, if we don't do it, we are lost. I mean, the, the, the powerful are doing this, the governments and the, uh, the financial institutions and the, um, the military organization are completely interconnected. We need to this kind of work and partnership with the ethical hackers and the uh, geek community in order to be effective and to properly investigate this landscape. Otherwise, uh, we need their skills. We need their, um, their um, way to see it, things. We need their technical capabilities. And we need their help to deal with this. I'm absolutely convinced about this. John, what do you think? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> of course, if you look, if you compare 2010 when I first encountered WikiLeaks and 2020 now, and if you look at the differences in how journalism has changed, right? Yeah. You know, in terms of, and, and, and first of all, I actually don't think that that it's right to say WikiLeaks is a hacker organization. I mean, like this whole dichotomy between journalists and hackers doesn't really fit with the WikiLeaks model because WikiLeaks, it, for me, and what I saw was very innovative journalism, right? Yeah. It, that that influ was influenced a lot by hackers and by kind of the technical community. So I'll get to that in a second, but I just want to just make a quick connection between 2010 and 2020. Yeah. This whole notion of collaborative journalism, right? You know, you know, Panama Papers and and you know all of these different projects that have gone on, which are great. You know that was a, a, a striking innovation by WikiLeaks, yeah, right? Absolutely. You know the submission system, right? Was you know which basically you know every newspaper in the world now has this idea of having a secure sub submission system. That was a complete innovation. I remember back in 2010 and how irritating it was that these people kept on telling me that I needed to encrypt things. And, and you know, and um, I just found them just, it was just a complete pain in the ass. And why were they yeah. bothering me? 
why were they ruining my life? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Didn't they, you know, um, and and so there were, you know, crypto phones, and there was, it was my first experience with Jabber, and, you know, and all of these kind of things, which didn't really exist, at least in, in my experience in journalism at that point, I hadn't run into it. Maybe others had. I, I hadn't run into it at all. Um, I mean, there were people who were using PGP, but they weren't that many. Um, yeah. And so those are all things that are, you know, but I just wanted to make kind of a couple of observations about how like the different communities, you know, there's also tension. There are also things that don't work very well, right? Between investigative journalists and hackers. And it would be kind of fun, I think, to also talk about that a bit. Um, because I see kind of two different trends coming. After 2008, journalism got financially a lot tighter. There was the financial crisis. There was a lot less money for journalism. Yeah. And there was less money for investigative journalism, right? Um, this is the time that the first kind of collaborations began between WikiLeaks and, and in my case, Der Spiegel, when I was at Der Spiegel back then, and The Guardian and The New York Times. Um, what happened between 2010 and 2013, I, I like to call it, you know, or 2014 maybe, um, a kind of Prague Spring of journalism, right? which was set off by WikiLeaks and continued by Snowden, by the Snowden re revelations, where there was like a four year period where Western publications were reporting continually and regularly critically about their own governments and about their own government's role in the kind of surveillance, international surveillance consensus that these governments had <coughs> unknown to their publics, right? Um, and so what we forget, though, because of that kind of Prague Spring, is that that squeezing of journalism that was going on um, was kind of overlooked in that period of 2010 to 2014. And I just wanted to, to describe, I mean, for a lot of people who came from... Um, it, what do you want to call it, establishment media or whatever, or, or mainstream media, whatever expression you want to use for it. People who were staff, people who, you know, like myself, I was a full-time employee. When you encounter the geek community and the technical community for the first time, you see often people um, who are basically kind of like a neoliberal wet dream. Do you know what I mean? They're entrepreneurs. They're willing to work through the nights. You know, they're against public television because public television is controlled by the state, you know, um, and have this kind of, you know, they're kind of like what Milton Freeman dreamed of, you know, this kind <laughs> of entrepreneurial mindset, right? Um, kind of a crude... I mean, and but again, it, when you experience journalism like I've experienced in Germany and, and, and in the United States and in Canada where I've worked, you know, there's also this kind of, you know, herd immunity, you know, to thinking in a lot of journalism, right? <laughs> so this kind of, you know, kind of capital city journalists, you know, who, you know, often are rightfully called microphone stands. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so in my encounter that with the hacking, you know, geek community, and then I, you know, and then also WikiLeaks, which I would say is a different thing. Um, there was, of course, a far greater willingness to be critical yeah. of governments and stuff. And I found that really exciting and really interesting and, and fantastic. Again, but there was also this kind of neoliberal values that were kind of, incorporated by people that I also found strange and alienating. Anyway, Andy, what was your experience? Ooh, well, I mean, I'm coming from a different background as I'm coming from the CCC scene. And, um, well, um, I would say my personal history was um, 
uh, also heavily influenced by trying not only to understand technology and playing with that and so on, but also the incidents that where hackers got killed, like the KGB story with Karl Koch in 1989, and then later the Tron story here in Berlin in 1998. That was latest for me the point where I really had to the impression I need to understand what is going on here in respect to intelligence services. What role do they play? What's the inter relationship with media? How can it be that the media environment that was friendly to us for a while uh, then finally walks away if one policeman makes a comment, oh, it could have been suicide because he was afraid to go to the army, which like made no sense in that scenario, but that's just a stupid example of a complex world. So when I started to work with journalists in a more professional way, and maybe I would say the um, the um, experience with the Edward Snowden material, so with the NSA material, was when I really got deeply involved um, on a daily basis, working with journalists, helping them to understand technology, processing stuff, anonymizing it, redacting stuff, and so on, and all the complexity. Um, I think there is a, a different mindset here to observe because journalists come not only from this established media, there's also different journalists out there. There's journalists who um, deliberately um, want to help those in power to stay like it is. They actually want to do their nine to five job. And the moment it gets critical, like you're dealing with CIA, with NSA stuff, and they make it clear, no, we don't want you to publish this. And they make it very clear through the legal department and so on. And then, OK, in Spiegel, we had the luck. We had the chief editorial. We had everybody on board. Still, um, we had, you know, we had to be careful and listen to legal advice and play it by the book and so on. But there was obviously other journalists who um, straightforward thought this is a betray of whatever. So, and um, I think you you learn the different characters then while you walk. Um, and not all journalists, even not all those who call themselves investigative, are really that critical of, of what they're doing. And all these technology components, when it comes to using encryption, you could translate in the hacker scene, you would say, oh, that's bad OPSEC, bad operational security. If you deal with a source and you forgot to do the encryption, or you leak kind of like what happened to the intercept. The intercept was was a project where Julian Assange, she, he used to say that's like an astroturfing thing. So they stole the idea of what WikiLeaks was doing, like with the submission source of submit stuff and so on. And they um, somehow gave people the impression they're doing the same thing, just maybe more specialized and even more professional and less character driven and so on. Uh, and then this um, reality winner, this young uh, lady comes with the material, sends it by the post, and they somehow forget to destroy the envelope. Yeah. And like she's completely exposed, she still sits in jail. And the question is, was this a failure or was it maybe deliberately to destroy the idea that an organization could protect their sources? Like we could say, okay, Chelsea Manning, that also didn't went well. But um, that was a completely different story, and that not had directly to do with Julian's acting. That was also partly that um, Chazia had confessed to the wrong people um, or to the wrong guy. So, however, I think there's many parameters here. And I mean, where we hopefully do agree a little bit is that something like WikiLeaks is a good democracy test. It's actually the best one I have seen. Because when um, really stuff are exposed at a scale and governments can't deal with transparency, then obviously there's something wrong in the democratic concept, which in theory is the citizens know what happens in their name and are in charge of evaluating and voting the government out if it does things in their name that they don't want them to do. But um, what I think what is missing is a complete reflection from the journalist side, not only of you two guys, I'm more talking about at scale. And unfortunately, this has led, has led to a confrontation. Um, and Julian has, um, yeah, I don't know, Julian has sometimes been become very bitter because he worked with like The Guardian, with The New York Times and so on back then. And he had the impression um, that at some point when he had brought them the stuff, and they had the opportunity to again be the best buddy of the government. 
they started to write about his dirty socks and his appearance, uh, dialogues in the meetings instead of the war crimes that the material he brought up to. And this, this bitterness is, of course, bad, and this has led to more escalation and fractions and so on. Um, so in an ideal world, we could talk about how we can combine the best of these worlds, because today I see, again, many journalists who, on the one hand side, they all enjoy getting material. On the other hand side, not everybody is really ready to see um, journalism as something that can also, the price can also be get into trouble. So um, a friend of mine, Michael Sontheimer from Spiegel, he used to say when he learned journalism, he's an older dude, uh, when he learned journalism, it was about to change the world when people became journalists. And now these young people, they, they become journalists to win journalistic prizes. And that's a complete different thing. So that it's more about making a career and being you know, in the established media and so on. And while, of course, now we have a completely different media scenario out there, we have all these kind of funny websites to call themselves news websites with their own financing, often also leading to yeah, corporations and parties and whatever. Um, there is still a lot of values to, to discuss here. And that's, I think, what we should do a little bit, because that's where I'm coming from, the idea of you know, freedom of information and so on. Just one tiny point. I mean, I don't think it's fair to say uh, use the word instead, because you know, I mean, uh, I'm very critical about a lot of what the Guardian did, but to say that they didn't report on war crimes and stuff is not true. No, right? no, that's and, no, but at some point it changed, didn't it? Well, and the other thing I just wanted to say is that we've also experienced in recent times kind of counter narrative journalism and counter narrative thinking <clears throat> you know in the trump era very much like in a german context <clears throat> basically has been like taken over by the afd and so when you come with you yeah. know and and the trump right right and you know and and kind of right wing populist kind of movements so traditionally in in that kind of pre period when you came with counter narrative it was generally seen as kind of more pro enlightenment, you know, exposing the government. Um, and often now I see, you know, again, all leading from 2008, where things get tighter and tighter, where politically things got even more tighter, and where counter narrative is almost, you know, or not always, but is often seen by leadership people, at, you know, they're immediately suspicious. You know, um, is this you know right wing populism, right? Um, on top of that came the incredible kind of conspiracy theories that the Trump era brought along. You know, of course, there were lots of right wing populist conspiracy theories, but there were tons of conspiracy theories that the liberal center also took on. the yeah. The idea that that Russia was behind almost everything. The, yeah. You know, that, wrong in the United States that we, you know, was the cause of Hillary Clinton losing the election. It was the cause of Brexit. You know, the idea, you know, this like kind of monocausal Russia thing that like went on. I'm just saying that made a lot of journalism less possible. Um, anyway, sorry to blab on. Go ahead. No, I mean, no, I, I'm with you just one second on conspiracy theories. I mean, we both discussed it many times and my accusation um, to this point is that while it is true there's completely stupid uh, conspiracy theories and I mean Nazi Germany is a, is, a, is a history lesson where the Nazis simplified a lot of complexity that led to an economic crash and gave people a very simple answer and created hate and so on so I'm very well aware of the mechanics but holy fuck there is conspiracies out there and if you look at what happens to Julians today Julian Assange and what what what's going on there in his trying to get a legal, um, you know, yeah, due process um, treatment or whatever, um, and what's going on surrounding it. Yes, there is conspiracies and there is people who conspire on high level, um, and that needs to be exposed. And I mean, Gavin McFadden tried to 
uh, inspire the young generation of journalists with stuff like, you know, challenge power, expose corruption, and so on. And these are things, I think, things that, that Stefania is very well connecting in her work. Well, I, I think uh, I would not uh, use the word conspiracy in the case of Julian Assange. I think they use it in a very with, instrumental with way. The, with a surveillance company that turned against him? How would you oh, call no, it? No, 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 no. Yes. I mean, uh, in with the all legal case, I think they were... I mean, you know that I have spent the last five years trying to get the documents about the case because, you know, without the... the the, the fact you cannot understand the case if you, if you don't get the documents. So if I look, for example, at how the Swedish case has been used in order to keep him, uh, you know, arbitrarily detained for uh, basically nine years inside the embassy, it's unbelievable. I mean, and when I got the documents from Sweden, I couldn't believe they released me those documents saying, basically exposing how the UK authorities were telling the Swedish prosecutors, don't come here, just question him only after extraditing him. And when I got a copy of these documents, I couldn't believe it. And they said, look, they are providing me the smoking gun. I mean, they are providing, which probably they, I don't know, they probably didn't even realize that it was the smoking gun. I don't know why they released me those documents. But in any case, if you look at how they use this case in an instrumental way, it was not a conspiracy, but it was rather using some Thing in an instrumental way. And so I think it's, uh, again, I believe that without proper investigative journalism, this could have never surfaced because these people, you know, these people want to keep all these kind of, you know, all these kind of things uh, secrets. Uh, they don't want to have these kind of things exposed. And this is why I'm basically fighting since 2015 because they, they just, after releasing me these documents, they absolutely don't want to release me anything. So I have spent five years litigating and litigating, going up to the Swedish Supreme Administrative Court and spending uh, thousands of euros in order to, to get these documents. But they don't want to release it because they know that the documents contain crucial information about the case. And the documents contain crucial information. Why? Because they still keep writing the documents as if the freedom of information doesn't exist. They they put they write down things. I realize this. Even the UK authorities, they still are writing these documents as if there is no freedom of information. So when you have journalists asking for these documents, they go up, they panic. They basically realize that the old things get exposed because they still write down everything on their documents. I mean, this is true for the Swedish prosecutors and the Swedish authorities, and it is also true for the UK authorities, and probably also for the US authorities, because they are trying, they are doing all they can to stop access to this to the US documents. So investigative journalism is still very, very relevant, and it is uh, what we really need, I believe, because no one needs the news anymore. I mean, we are drowning in news. We, we need the proper investigative journalism. And this alliance between the geek community, the hacker, call it as you want, the hacker community, ethical hacker community, or the geek community, or the tech community is more relevant than ever. And uh, again, I want to I want to make you realize how crucial that we have, uh, how different the uh, the WikiLeaks model by uh, with respect to other models. The fact that we have these documents published in full. That's really crucial. That's that really make a difference. You know, I, I'm sure you realize when we had that uh, Khashoggi case, the first thing that the Washington Post did was to access the hacking team emails where you could see evidence of 
the surveillance company providing training to the Saudi people. So the first thing they did was to access the WikiLeaks documents, which were published five years before, and that they are still relevant. And the same with the cables. Please, John. No, no, no. I, what I, I just wanted, just a short point. I don't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to say that, I mean, that was one of the things I wanted to mention earlier. It was also in terms of 2010, 2020 innovations that have happened. I mean, it, it's hard to imagine, but back then, it was hard to publish full documents. Yeah. I remember at Spiegel, there were a couple of colleagues and I, you know, we were like really into like, why can't we like, you know, there's the internet, we can publish it online. There's enough space there to do that, right? You know, uh, and that wasn't, you know, there were some people who liked the idea, but you know, it was rarely done, right? There used to be a special thing in the Frankfurt uh, Wunschau years ago where they would publish a document. That was a very unusual thing. Yeah. And that was one of the big innovations of that whole WikiLeaks era, right? Was was the idea, you know, this, you know, idea of scientific journalism that you can actually refer to the document that you're writing about. But one of the I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> maybe I shouldn't no. talk too much, but but one of the disadvantages, let's not forget, is that a lot of investigative journalists became lazy, right? You know, read document, write story, <clears throat> right? You know, this whole idea of going out and doing legwork and actually investigating things yourself often got replaced by, you know, getting lots of documents that made great stories and big headlines. I mean, the whole, the whole scale changed with the WikiLeaks revelations and the Snowden documents the scale on what was a big international story, like one of those Snowden documents would have been, you know, or, or you know, it, it would have been a huge international story. Yeah. And you had so many at the time, right? It was just yeah. the whole, it was like an inflation of, of, of source material. Anyway, Andy, yeah. sorry. Andy, um, I, I'm thinking, I mean, this um, idea of investigative journalism, um, I think we need to redefine it. Uh, what I would love to see is investigative critical journalists because, I mean, leaking documents has been, maybe Julian did indeed uh, with the platform and so on, like he modernized journalism in a way. But of course, the challenging power aspect, so the exposing of government documents that were kept secret and so on, it's not that the government just saw it and disliked it and dealt with him. They also have created a counter model and that is like where they now leak documents in their favor to like get exactly the lazy journalist jump on it and say haha yeah you you are our best broadcaster and then you have um i'm not sure i should mention projects that i suspect to be working that way which is like intelligence agency spin-off and just you know drop some documents and the journalist jump on it and that's a great story and i mean we both know um, John and I have uh, actually tried or had experience with journalists who were, let's say, in the hierarchy a little bit higher, and they were all suspect to have made their career because they always had the best documents. And even the Spiegel once wrote about one of these journalists when he left the journalist, you know, he always brought the best documents, but somehow how he got them, that remained a question. And so there is, of course, journalists who make a career with the best intelligence context they have, and they are like a spin-off of the intelligence agencies. They make a great career. It's just that they can't bite the hand that feeds them. So they have a blind spot when it comes to reporting critical about, you know, the sources of the documents or the specific entities that feeds them with information. So I think... Um, <laughs> Stefania is is for me, I mean, I really appreciate your courage and your German word as hartnäckig. I don't know, you really bite into things and stay on the line. And that's very helpful. But it's also helpful to see you when, when I've worked with you and I've, we've done it multiple times that I always appreciate that even when I give you something or whatever, you're always critical and okay, I need to check it and so on. And that's, I think, a very important part of, of uh, in investigative, critical, journalistic character, how it should be, that it's not only about getting some fancy documents, but really checking out what's behind it. And is it authentic? And is it maybe the real, is this document authentic? Okay, but it tell the, the whole story. 
perhaps there may be something missing. Because often, and the principle of disinformation is not lying, it's just giving a partial reality. Yeah, I mean, um, I would like to tell you what happened behind the scene for the Snowden documents. So for example, when we, when we published, it was very interesting because um, basically Glenn Greenwald, I published uh, thanks to Glenn Greenwald, I have no problem to tell this, and he was kind enough to share the documents some documents about Italy, and he requested uh, to ask for comment, <clears throat> just for comment to the Italian authorities before publishing, the day before uh, publication. So at the very last minute, uh, we were supposed to ask for comment to the Italian authorities, and I did. The day before, or two days before, um, I asked to the Italian authorities, and uh, no, actually, I asked to the NSA and after publication to the Italian authorities. So the NSA was panicking. They were, they were trying to know what kind of documents we had, uh, and they said, could you please tell the titles of the documents? I said, no, we, we won't provide it, and so on. So at the end, they didn't provide anything, uh, any uh, comment, uh, just irrelevant PR, nothing at all. After publishing, I asked for um, comment to the Italian um, uh, to the Italian uh, government, and uh, it was very interesting because they said we will put you in touch with the uh, public affairs divisions of the Italian intelligence. So it was for me. It was the first time I was talking to the. Uh, public to the Italian intelligence at all. Never in my life as a journalist I, to I had talked to the intelligence services because I think the worst about about the intelligence services. So I, it was the very first time. So I expected something like, uh, uh, you know, not aggressive, but something adversarial. It was not like that. It was like they were very warm and very friendly and very, you know, very welcome. And, and at the end they said, uh, we would like to work with you, not to influence you, your work, but just to have an exchange. And they said, thank you, and never contacted them again. But just to let you understand how they approach the journalists. They are trying to be seductive. They are not adversarial at all. So, I mean, I imagine that for some colleagues, it's quite an attractive, uh, you know, it quite, it's quite an attractive um, relationship because you are welcome, we will explain to you, we don't want to influence you, we just want to provide you some facts. And of course, it's not like that. They want to have influence and control on your work. So, for me, I, it was... <laughs> Yes, I, I could add a little, a, a yes. little detail because similar to what you experienced when in Spiegel it was also that the legal department suggested we inform the NSA and ask for a statement. They never gave a statement, but they always sent um, the list of questions back, like the list of documents and also who is working on inside Spiegel on this document or which external says, give us all their living addresses, their shoe sizes and so on. It was like... We had to tell them in very polite ways to, you know, back off. Oh. But um, it was interesting how they approached it. <clears throat> but, but there, was know, one, there yeah. was one metaphor that I just wanted to, I mean, in terms of the, the, the tension and the conflicts that happened, which I think we've kind of, like, skirted around. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> in some ways, um, when I experienced the geek community, it, 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 it and they look at kind of establishment media, right? It's like they're the Uber drivers, you know, and we're the we're the staff taxi drivers of a company with a full time job, right? You know, and you know, and there's this whole kind of you know being convinced that we're the new technological wave and changing things, and it's interesting because I don't include WikiLeaks in that, right? Yeah. Uh, I. I, I see WikiLeaks is a different thing, but this is about hackers and journalism, right? Um, and and this whole idea that you know, um, anyway, I 
You're not. You, you think I'm wrong, Andy? Go. What do you, you think? That's no, 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 no. It's fine. No, no. Go ahead. Um, because you excluded WikiLeaks. I mean, yes, of course, there is some. I mean, the trouble is that state-owned media and mainstream media, they all have something in common. It's the old model, and it used to be in a very hierarchical way. Uh, before I stopped um, doing like commercial work in the security area, I once found myself in a funny country in, let's say, still on the continent of Europe, but not in the EU Europe, and I met the staff of uh, the prime minister there, and they asked me to solve for them the Twitter problem, and I was like, what's the Twitter problem? And he like, yeah, well, since Twitter is now a country, it seems to be just bringing up critical comments about our prime minister, and he doesn't like us, and he's used to, you know, he can deal with the media, with the journalists, you know, he, he addresses the chief editor, so with the radio stations, or the TV, that's all under control, but this Twitter, there's somehow a mechanics missing to deal with it, and I was like, like, hmm, but maybe, you know, the trouble is not that they bring up critical voices. The trouble is maybe that they are the first ones that allow the critical voices that are there to be, like, you know, appearing and so on. Like, yeah, we know, but that's not what you wanted to hear. And I was like, what the fuck? What did you want to hear? And then they showed me their ideas if, you know, they had gone around and found a company allowing them a tool which is actually allowing you to place and kidnap hashtags and in this case it was completely stupid at the end of the presentation was Nike Turnshoes so you, you come up with a political discussion and you kidnap it to Nike Turnshoes so why do I'm telling you all this because um, I think um, the the classical media model of course it has a history but it has a bottleneck and the bottleneck is that somewhere is a person that can be arrested and even julian is facing a little bit of that problem today and the question is how can we truly decentralize media and make it let's say give it the freedom it has in theory per constitution um, without getting into trouble exposing those being corrupt because in some countries that seems to not work by democratic standards. And I'm not right. sure. If... I, 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 I'm completely with you on that, right? I'm completely with you on that. But I really think it's important to remember <clears throat> that just because a new technology like Uber is there or Airbnb, right? That, you know, the latest neoliberal fad, right? Uh, is not necessarily, in journalism, is not necessarily better journalism. Right. Um, and this idea that <clears throat> just because you reorganize the way it's done um, in a more neo, it, because there's there's the free speech a aspect to it and critical voices. Right. But then there's also the economic model side of things. And I think often the two get confused. No, that's true. And I mean, especially, I do still like to work with Spiegel because they have a fact-checking department that's really a resource. It's called the documentation. So you come up with some names and some information and they bring you the company records and everything and everything is well thought out. And that type of resource you don't find in this little media spin-offs, which uh, give you a little bit of money for some lines of funny reporting, but they do not often have like the, the lawyers or whatever so it's all up to you to to deal with the reputational damage that you create when you're based on um bullshit or i mean on something that's inaccurate which happens so which needs to be that's why fact checking is important so i'm with you that there is a resource and a structural issue but um yeah there's different components i just want to say if anyone wants to ask a question they should ask a question yeah as I also think time-wise, that's... But our moderator seems to have rushed away from the place. <laughs> I mean, they left from where the rocket flies. There was this lady, Patricia. Is she still with us? Can I just add one thing? Yeah, I think that this, the, the, situa the Julian Assange situation should be you know, should make uh, whistleblowers and, and sources think how, uh, who are the decent people who have not threw Julian Assange under the bus. So they should think about it before contacting journalists 
and media organization because uh, we have seen that people who had a huge, a huge, you know, they had huge scoops and never published a single line about uh, the horrific treatment of Julian Assange. I mean, I'm completely upset about this. So I believe that the the sources and whistleblowers should think uh, a lot about uh, this kind of treatment by some media organization and some individual journalists before leaking or before talking to a media organization. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> there's just one other thing I wanted to mention that I think is really an amazing kind of new form of journalism that came out of that era. And when I look at the digital library of uh, American di diplomacy, right? You know, um, because one of the amazing things that journalistically that WikiLeaks did with all of those diplomatic cables was not only getting the stuff from Chelsea Manning, right? Yeah. You know, but actually they went and got stuff that had been kind of somewhat released on FOIAs, cleaned it up and put it into this public archive. And so it's really quite amazing. I don't know if you saw recently, there was a podcast about the assassination of the uh, Pakistani former prime minister, Benazir Bhutto. It was, a, it was like an eight part BBC podcast, right? Did very well, it was on the world service. It was amazing how often they went into the WikiLeaks, you know, archive of, of diplomatic cables. I mean, it, 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 they, they've established kind of like a handbook of current history um, with that. And that's a kind of a form of journalism that's never existed before. Patricia's back, I'll, I'll shut up. Patricia, do we have first questions or should we continue here? I think we're on for the first question. Did I hear that right? Just one second. Yep. Okay. So the first question came in. How can we ensure journalists working in investigative space are familiar with secure communications techniques like OpenPGP, XMPP, and others? Who wants to reply? I can tell how. Well, it's hard. It's hard work. We have to ensure the software is usable. Otherwise, we'll have to babysit the Stefanias and the John Gutzes. Sorry to say it like this, uh, on their labs and um, help them to work with it. Where Stefania is very good; she has a mathematical background. But many journalists are um, overwhelmed by the complexity of the technology on top of the complexity of the issues they're dealing with. So we need to make things simple and secure. Yeah, I mean, it needs to be better designed, right? It needs to be easy, right? It, and the idea that you're going to, um, you know, go to all of these incredibly secure measures of talking and communicating with each other about something that you're going to put in the newspaper in a half an hour uh, is sometimes brain dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, we, we could start a dispute here because the trouble is, of course, that sometimes you have highly critical information. And even when talking to a journalist in the same room, like you have to ask, would you please leave your fucking iPhone or your Android phone outside of the room and so on? Because otherwise, even starting to talk about anything is already a lost cause. So I think, unfortunately, John, it's not only about making technology simple and secure. That would be beautiful. But it's also about the mentality of, OK, I got yeah. something to protect. I take my yeah. responsibility, and that's often missing. Yeah. Improvable, mm -hmm. we could say. Although I can say that in my world of journalism, the use of encryption between 2010 and 2020, when I look at that difference, you know, it, it's very widespread. You know, discussion groups happen on encrypted chat systems. That didn't happen 10 years ago. That's really changed. Of course. That's true. I mean, that's absolutely true. I mean, if I look back, back in the in 2009, 2010, we had nothing. We had basically PGP and nothing, and very little more than that. So, I mean, in these days, we have many chances at least. But still, uh, the companies are risk adverse about using encryption because, for example, here, 
there are laws which um, make uh, the the media company responsible, but liable for um, anything you can do using Tor. So whenever I talk to my editors, they tell me, tell me, well, we have as a company, as a media company, if you do, if you commit any crime using the Tor, we are liable. So we have, so they are very risk adverse. They are still risk adverse. So most of the time, I have to find other solutions. Uh, and uh, as uh, as about sources, as about sources or whistleblower appro approaching journalists, I think they should be careful in understanding who has an experience in dealing with this, who has, uh, for example, who offers uh, some encryption tools to get contacted, secure drop or uh, PGP or things like that. If a reporter, if a journalist doesn't offer this kind of solution, it's very difficult because they just have to contact him by email. So I think it's really important that they look at the journalists, that they look what kind of tools the journalists offer in order to communicate securely, safely. That's really important. So they should uh, be careful about who they contact. Uh, if, the, if Patricia, is there another question? Otherwise, I'll say one other thing quickly. Well, we have more questions, but I think we've also got enough time to. So why don't you just carry on, and then we uh, continue with the next quickly. question. I mean, um, it, the the other side of that equation is what, of what I mentioned earlier is that journalists need to bring, of course, a desire to learn, right, and a desire, yeah. you know, of course, to protect their sources, but also a curiosity and uh, <clears throat> and a respectful approach to you know what is it that can be offered right how can i be helped and i just want to say personally when i look over the last 10 years actually someone you first took me up with years ago andy when i look at the you know um these people who i've dealt with over the years it's amazing how patient and how nice <laughs> and how thoughtful they have been with my technological retardedness. And I just, yeah, I just want at this point, want to say thank you. Anyway. Anything more to add? Yeah, maybe just one little aspect. Of course, the um, security aspect and the whole aspect of the mentality and what we, what we see that the CIA that Pompeo was not very pleased with the publications of their stuff and the State Department, Hillary Clinton was not, and so on. Um, while um, Julian currently faces a shitty situation and others surrounding him as well, um, I think there we don't have to underestimate that the strongest signal the Pompeos of this world try to send is to their own people. So. And yeah. so the reality winner, the Chelsea Manning treatment, is also something very important to have a look on it. And the question is, how can we, so that's a, a huge responsibility to anyone involved, technologists, as well as hackers, as well as journalists and so on, to ensure that we don't bring people into that kind of trouble. And that's, I think, uh, what, what should be in our minds to like really is the goal to um, do not get people into jail when they provide crucial information for critical review of governmental actions and so on. That's, uh, I just want to add one thing. And that's why it's important to, uh, for a source or a whistleblower to be very careful about who they contact. It's not enough to contact the intercept because they have a good history of working on the Snowden files. So they have to be careful about contacting the right journalists because it makes a difference whether you contact a journalist who has an ethical approach and has skills. I mean, the Intercept, in the case of Reality Winner, did very badly. They could have done very easily whatever check. They had the Snowden files. They had a lot of people with experience. They didn't even contact their own security department, as far as I can understand from from my article. So, I mean, it's all about mm -hmm. contacting the right person. It's not about the organization. The organization uh, is not enough to contact the right organization. You have to contact 
the right journalist, someone who has an ethical approach, who is serious about protecting sources, and who is willing to understand how source protection works, who has an experience in dealing with this kind of situation. Yeah, I mean, just, just one quick thing, and then we should get to the next question. But let's not forget that, as far as I understand it, I'm, I may have this wrong, but <clears throat> the journalist who did the reality winner story is the same journalist who, who uh, whose lack of operative security uh, played a role in the arrest of the CIA whistleblower Kiriakou. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Anyway, are there other questions? Absolutely. So the next one is also an interesting one. How can we ensure investigative journalism continues to exist? It is very expensive. It is very niche in most media organizations. The intercept is good to have, but their existence is based on the goodwill of a single entrepreneur, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I'd like to say something quickly about that, if I may. Um, in a country where you have public television, um, don't get lost in neoliberal libertarian nonsense about abolishing uh, public television, because the idea that public television, and of course I work for public television, you know, I should say that, um, but is a, a way of funding journalism which is not based on the profit motive. And I think that's an important, you know, I'm not saying it's perfect in all cases yeah. and in all countries, but it is a model that should be continued. Anyway, Stefania and Andy. No, no, I agree. First of all, I agree with you that the, the, we need public uh, journalism, absolutely. But in addition to this, I think that the readers, uh, listeners can do a lot. They can, they can uh, just pressure and write uh, to the media in order to keep the, the journalists doing the right work. So they should be interested rather than clicking in whatever get published, whatever silly things get published, they should stimulate people and press the media organization to do proper investigative work rather than just publishing or relaunching uh, stories. So they, they can do it. I mean, they should email to our editors. They should email to our editors in chief in order to understand which directions, which uh, kind of journalism they care most about, you know, because they can do a lot from this point of view. Andy. Yeah, I mean, I have some thoughts on this, um, but it's very tricky because, um, I mean, investigative journalist often ha is based on legwork, as John said. It has to do with critical mindset, and sometimes you need a huge amount of resources. I mean, Stefania, you, I don't know, engage how many lawyers working on the FOIA stuff. Um, and that's hardly because your publishers support you so well with financial resources. That also has to do with that there is foundations in the context of um, these works of critical journalism that supports um, free information acts and other things. And that unfortunately has become almost a, a default or whatever a scenario. So you cannot rely on thinking that you find any publisher or any news organization that will just support all the work that is necessary to get real um, shit done. Um, so I don't have a, a good solution. On the other hand side, I should of course promote, you know, I'm here as a member of board of the Holland Foundation. We do support these kind of things. We collect for money for Wikileaks and for other projects. We, for example, support Fraktinstadt. That's like a German institution doing this FOIA request in an almost automated way so that it's easy for people who do not have the legal and procedural knowledge, stuff like that. But of course, um, we Germans shouldn't, you know, even simulate to have solutions for the rest of the planet. So these kind of things need to happen everywhere and as decentral as possible. But before we get to the next question, real quick, I just wanted to mention, you know, that there is this whistleblower village, you know, uh, in the RC3 world to discuss these kind of questions. If anyone wants to, you know, that's a good place to go to discuss these things. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, great hint. Thank you very much. So the next one is also a good one. 
how to motivate ethical hackers and, in capital letters, journals to go after illegal or corrupt state actions when the public cases like Manning, Winner, Assange, Snowden, and etc. are basically worked over successfully by these governments. Isn't this game over? Well, I well. that's an interesting question. It really is. I mean, um, I think for a whistleblower to look and see the incredible impact that those stories had, that kind of Prague spring of journalism from 2010 to 2014, kind of the WikiLeaks Snowden common era, um, it, it's amazing the impact that that stuff had. And it wasn't useless. It wasn't... Um, uh, you know, I mean, and in the Snowden Endgame, you know, I think, you know, congratulations. And he re recently just had a baby, you know, a few days ago. I mean, um, it, I, I'm, yeah, what do you think, Stefania, Andy? I mean, it was, I think this uh, journalism was, has been so important that, that we absolutely have. Can you hear me? Okay. So I think this journalism has been so important and game changer that we cannot afford to to lose it. So I mean uh, that's why we have to defend the whistleblowers uh, uh, and Julian Assange for his terrible treatment. We cannot afford to lose these people. We cannot afford to have these people treated this way because this is precisely what the governments want to do, and we have to we have to fight for them because we cannot we cannot get them imprisoned for life we cannot get them get crushed because that is what the governments want and we we have to stay with them that's why i was telling we never a source or a whistleblower contact a journalist should consider how that journalist treated julian assange because many of them got huge scoops and then they are silent in these days, which is, I, mean, I think it is completely unacceptable. For me, it is a kind of, you know, it is a kind of unacceptable behavior. It's uh, both professionally and ethically, I believe. So uh, it's, uh, it makes a difference whether they spoke out for Julian Assange or whether they have remained silent. Yes. I would like to point out two aspects. The one is, um, I really think it is totally fair to say that many mistakes happened within the context of Julian's work, of Wiglick's work, of all the investigative problems. Even looking back to my own, own work in the Snowden context, um, you know, I'm, I'm very open to sit with anyone together and to uh, like, like also say, okay, this is the shit we've done wrong. This needs to be improved. I maybe don't have a solution, but I can tell you exactly how it went wrong. So I'm I'm trying to be as self-critical as possible. On the other hand side, um, I'm I do not like the attitude of saying, okay, you know, it's all fucked up. Julian will die in prison, and everybody else will be arrested, and that's end of the game, and so on. Um, because of two things. The one is exactly what Stefania said that. You know, that's exactly what the governments want. They want to give you the impression yeah. that um, you're done. Uh, secondly, there is this huge group dynamics, even in CCC, and it's kind of a pleasure to today not sit in front of this huge auditorium with 3,000 people, because either you are on that hero track and you know, haha, you done the greatest work and blah, 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 and everybody's happy, or you're on the loser track and you're like, mm -hmm, yeah, okay, shit. So, and this group dynamics are really not helpful if it comes to sorting out in a very fine granularity way uh, what went wrong, what can be done better, and how do we move on. And, I mean, it was not expected that governments would just be happy to lose their ability to keep things secret and that the CIA would be happy to, like, have their secret tools published or that the NSA would be having their secret methods to surveil all of us, our telecommunications published. So 
it was kind of to be expected. Yes, that's right. But on the other hand side, it hasn't done in history before. So how should yeah. Julian have better prepared for it? Like live in a bunker? Would that have yeah. saved him? You know? So yeah. this and is... also the, 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 the state repression makes it very difficult to have an honest public discussion about everything that went wrong. Do you know what I mean? It's because Sure, sure. Yeah. There's some some legal things as well that, that are not helpful in some sociological things and human beings sometimes have behaviors and blah 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 no I'm, I'm with you okay but i'm just saying um i would like to have a constructive discussion and and i think it's fair to say that yes mistakes were made of course but also things were a bit unique and have, have not done before and we needed to do that experience maybe for others who will do better than we um, to not make the same mistakes again, at least. And um, I'm not giving up as far as, as, it, as it goes, but yeah, it has become a little tricky. And what currently would be helpful again is to get a little bit more of the mainstream media understanding that this is also about them. Um, because if, you know, Julian gets into 175 years for espionage act and so on, of course, he'll not be the last one. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, let's not forget that, of course, there were mistakes, mistakes were done, but at the end of the day, Julian and WikiLeaks did extremely well. I mean, they published documents, and of course, when you publish documents, you can make mistakes. If you don't publish, you don't make mistakes. I, I mean, I don't want to... I don't want to dismiss the Panama Papers. They were incredibly important uh, documents, but at the end of the day, it's uh, WikiLeaks that publish documents, make them fully available. So if you make documents fully available, millions of documents, of course you make some mistakes. It's uh, normal. But at the end of the day, it was greatly exaggerated, everything, even the threats. I mean, 10 years later, uh, 10 years after publishing these documents, we are still discussing the victims that never were. I mean, never were, a, there was never ever a single victim. No one died, no one was injured, no one ended up in jail. And we, I mean, we spent a lot of time discussing the, the victims. Uh, that, that, was not even the, that was not even the things I was meaning when I said mystics. I was more talking about in the relationship with um, established media, for example, oh, sometimes see. people got a little impatient on um, the side of um, the more technology and hacker minded driven people with, you know, uh, these kind of things. I think there were too many fallouts that were not helpful that now play out to be not helpful. But there was also a lot of energy against things brought yeah, up. Let's try to get some, we only got 10 more minutes. Let's try to get okay. no, uh, Hold on. Yeah. Baby. Sorry to interrupt you guys, but we are getting, and this is why I ran away, uh, because I was getting direct feedback. Obviously, we have a lot of um, people in the audience who would love to hear your WikiLeaks talk again. So... Um, Two options. So we, we, we either we have yeah. we have a couple of more questions related to, to, to this topic. However, we can just expand your streaming time a little bit because we do not have an adjacent co um, um, talk. So we could give you actually um, an additional half an hour. So um, half past Fine. half past eight. I, um, uh, if, if you don't want to do I this, do um, talk, totally up to you. But again, so uh, we're, we're getting a lot of questions. To, People asking, you, can you can you repeat your WikiLeaks talk? Uh, but are you meaning me, or are you talking here about this all round? I think Andy, this is mainly this is mainly uh, okay. going to you. This question. Okay, I, I can do that, but I would prefer that not to do it right away because I would need to get my slides, and that was a technical fuck up this morning or this uh, two o'clock thing. And I think that, this is uh, why so many people would like to hear it again. Sure, but I would like to not do it right here and right now, but um, give me a time slot either tonight or tomorrow, and I'll. I, that's what I suggested also to the guys who I was in technical contact from this other stage to do. Yeah, I, I can't continue, but you're welcome to continue without me. That, that's absolutely fine. I mean, no, no, we, we, no, we, no. we've got our, we've also got no. two more questions um, here in this uh, related to this, to, to this talk. Sort that out. 
Yeah, let us sort my talk out maybe separately, logistically, when is a good time, and okay. you, you tell me how we do it. Okay. What are the other two questions? So the next one is also, have you thought about taking advantage of the security services interest in your journalist activities to actually catch them red-handed? Um, so, uh, for example, uh, run down, uh, run your own hidden video surveillance of yourself to catch them when they place the bug in your crypto phone or tamper with your door lock, um, etc., etc. Um, also, um, the visitor would be interested to hear more about the um, incidents Andy briefly mentioned in his previous talk. Okay, <laughs> I just want to say one thing, uh, an example that I thought was really amazing. And it was from a very major newspaper, a very important international newspaper. I was contacting this journalist about uh, a story he had done about a German general <clears throat> in Afghanistan who had been in favor of kind of more bombings or whatever it was. I can't remember the actual content of the story. And he was experiencing intense surveillance and he immediately said, we should only communicate via PGP. But then on the open line, he kept on hinting. He didn't say it, but he kept on hinting that the person behind the surveillance and trying to suppress the story was his source. He didn't say it was his source, right? But he kind of, you know, he, he kind of played along and gave the impression that someone could come to a conclusion that he was the source and he kind of reversed the game. And I thought that was really clever and funny. Yeah. Did it work? I don't know. We had fun doing it. Yes, I think I will answer on that question separately. Of course, I mean, when I got um, first time in the embassy, actually my first scene was uh, Laura Portas, who had been the, the day before, and she was still doing documentary filmmaking then. Um, that was before Snowden, by the way. Um, she like um, led me to the, the, the last room there where Julian had some little space and um, put her camera on and asked me to pull the curtain to the side. And I was like, okay. So I went in front of her, pulled the curtain to the side. And what happened then was completely unbelievable. And it was like three policemen immediately jumping in front of me, a second row building up a third row. And it was like, what? I just touched the curtain. Like she was filming it. So we were like, okay, this is a bit intense, and this is like in every Hollywood movie, you would say, this is, you know, fucking Hollywood switch away. This is too ridiculous, but that is how it started there. And of course, we had many ideas on to make, you know, uh, understand the surveillance by triggering it and so on. And it's not that it didn't happen, but at some point you realize, you know what, um, should we maybe stop making jokes here? They might cut it out of context and... Um, bring it up against us because, of course, when you sit there over hours and have a drink, you start to make funny, uh, start to develop funny ideas, and that's, yeah, I'm, I'm still. That's a very tricky situation because, especially with someone like Julian, who was very long in there, and of course, you have this attitude to cheer him up once in a while, uh, but I'm not sure I made all the best jokes, um, if that was wise and so on. I don't know what. What about your experience, Stefania? John, you were also there. Well, I'm very, I'm very interested in uh, checking what is going on with the Spanish investigation about uh, our targeting inside the embassy because, uh, you know, as I said, the whole work, my whole work about the, the WikiLeaks and later on about Snowden was basically uh, due to the fact that my source back in 2008 had stopped talking to me because she was convinced she was under surveillance. So 11 years after of all this work, learning to use encryption, learning to use uh, anti-surveillance techniques and so on, now I want to discover how, how far I was, uh, how I was able to, whether I was able to protect the sources. Because when I was inside the embassy, I had very important information with me. And they got access to my devices. So I would like to understand whether they were able to access the encrypted data, whether they were able to decrypt it. 
And I'm very, you know, I'm very, very happy that we have a, an investigation, a Spanish criminal investigation, because, um, you know, not so many episodes like that happened to me. But, for example, back in 2015, I was uh, heavily targeted and my data, important data was stolen to me. And uh, I filed a criminal complaint in Rome and nothing happened. Then, uh, basically in 2008, I went to the hospital uh, and uh, my medical record disappeared into nothing. Again, I filed a criminal, uh, criminal complaint, nothing happened. Now I want to see what happened in Spain. Maybe the Spanish investigators will be more effective in investigating this uh, this um, Spanish story, this this targeting inside the embassy. And you know, I I think we are very lucky that we have a, a criminal investigation because uh, in this case they cannot say we are paranoid. There will be a criminal investigation, there will be a judge, there will be a prosecutor looking into it and getting factual information and getting, you know, criminal uh, evidence. So I'm very, I'm very curious to see what <clears throat> is going on. And I was really upset why my for when my former newspaper said, we won't assist you legally. And and this is one of the reasons why I left La Repubblica, basically. When they said, we won't assist you, okay, that's enough for me. I mean, I was there for you. I was there for La Repubblica. I was uh, uh, in the embassy for them. And my contract, my journalistic contract required them to protect me. And I was left completely alone. So, I mean, it, it's one of the reasons why I left. I wanted to, just one yeah. sentence, and that is, I just wanted to say how happy I am that Norddeutsche Rundfunk, NDR, the broadcaster I work for, actually, you know, did follow through and filed a complaint about the surveillance of NDR journalists when we went to the embassy, which is now part of the Spanish investigation. Was there one last question? We've actually got three more questions for you to go. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Let's quickly, I have to go at, at, at exactly half. Well, then a quick one, because this is uh, addressed to all of you. So what is the future of international investigative journalism empowered by hacking? Is it something that is going to vanish, absorbed by the mainstream and confined in a niche? Or are you more optimistic about the future? I'm optimistic. I mean, I know that... The <laughs> I'm optimistic. And uh, I think this kind of journalism is crucial. And even if uh, we have seen all sorts of um, attempts to kill it, I think this kind of journalism produces such important revelations, such important stories, that at the end, competition is competition, and media will jump in this kind of, of work. So I, I'm optimistic. I'm not so... Uh, I'm, I don't want to be pessimistic about it because I think there is still room for this kind of important work. I, I mean, I also think it can stay extremely relevant. I mean, w when the kind of, you know, the data leaks that happen are about our own governments and about our own, the, the, the countries that we are responsible for. Um, there's a lot of journalism and data leaks about countries, you know, that are doing bad things in other places, and that's good journalism. That's fine journalism. But I find, like, our our primary duty is to report about the crimes and the misbehavior of our own governments and our own kind of Western alliance. Um, <clears throat> and when the when data leaks and whatever working together with hackers goes in that direction, then I remain very optimistic. Yep. Yeah, I can be optimistic when I talk with Christian. Sometimes the the Icelandic Constitutional Court has um, made clear that publication of material, even if it was obtained illegal, but it turned out to be in the public interest, 
there's no liability for the journalist dealing with it. And that's, of course, very important for, for Chris Nielsen working as the chief editor of Weeklies these days. So, And that's something that maybe is not clear in all jurisdictions yet, but I have some hope for continental Europe on that. If I'm so optimistic about the country formerly known as the United States and so on, I'm not sure. Uh, I have to sign oh. off. I have to sign off. I just wanted to say that in the whistleblower village, there's kind of like a quest adventure game about how to deal with these questions that that's uh, apparently very fun to work on. Thanks for having me. I have to say goodbye. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank, Thank you. you so much, John, okay. for joining us. Okay. So I, I just want, can I just add one thing? Sure. Uh, I think Andy said something very important about the fact that, um, you know, finally we have this kind of uh, consensus that publishing uh, material which has been hacked and probably stolen in certain situations is perfectly, is perfectly legal as far as you do proper journalistic work on it, you verify the documents as genuine and publicly relevant. So this is another thing which basically uh, Wikileaks was crucial about this because before there was no such consensus. And now, I mean, it's uh, very, very common and ac widely accepted. As far as you do proper journalism, as far as you verify the documents are genuine and they are in the public interest so you have the right to publish them and this is uh, something which we you know we have uh, we have thanks also thanks to wikileaks which pioneer this stefania i think we just lost your audio no i'm oh, here okay. can you hear me i hear her then, as well okay then it must maybe latency Anything more to add? I've got two more questions for you. Go ahead with the questions. Where does the most relevant investigative journalism take place nowadays? So the question is, is it still the big media like Spiegel, New York Times and so on? Or how about Corrective, Reporter ohne Grenzen or even individuals making use of other platforms like any platform you can think of? And um, are they gaining importance? I think they do gain importance, and I think the the smaller um, platforms have more um, innovative um, character. However, um, what is a little bit missing is the meshing, I would say. Um, so yeah. what what WikiLeaks invented then was also a, a process which I use a very dangerous term that Julian once invented for it. He called it impact maximization. He later asked me to, you know, after the elections um, to not use it anymore. He thought it would lead to misunderstanding. But what it meant that back then was that uh, WikiLeaks would give media partners access to the raw material, of course, clean from source issues, so scrubbed as it was called. And the journalist was help with the contextualization to make really understand where does this document come from, what does it describe, what's the context of the persons, and so on. And then the publication would happen on the same day, on the same day. So WikiLeaks would publish the raw material linking to the contextualization to the articles of the journalist or the mainstream media, or whatever you call it. And the other way around, the journalists would publish their contextualization article and link to the raw documents. And that was a beautiful game of helping each other to like people get it and that is something that i think um the, the smaller platforms yes of course they try to do it all themselves and that's kind of okay i can understand that also who needs an, another intermedia when you have all the things but on the hand, other hand side to reach out to more people you do need to kind of find out how to how to channel that and so on and there's i think more work to be done Without that, you need to end up working for mainstream media or whatever, but maybe at least um, find some, um, some, some procedures, some processes, or maybe befriend a journalist, journalists who are interested um, to help you bridge the gap. Because often the trouble is you publish something on your very innovative thing, no one realized it is. Two weeks later, you, you go, maybe you are in this context of the mainstream media and the journalist there 
wants to report about it. And he goes to his chief editor and says, hey, look what I found. And says, yeah, but that's two weeks old. That's old shit. We can't report old shit. And that's so weird because you lose the momentum and then you get accused that um, it was already published. And this has become a very weird attack channel to keep things out of the yeah, normal media environment. Yeah. I mean, there are some there are some situations where I really would like to work with very big media organization, like, for example, in the case of my uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, litigation about uh, getting the full documentation of Julian Assange and, and uh, the WikiLeaks journalists. So you have to realize that I have spent five years and it has been so hard just to get the money and to be able to pay for seven lawyers. Imagine if I had done this, supported by a big media organization, probably, I mean, it would have been much, much more easier. And I would have spent just one tenth of the effort. Uh, and, but at the same time, I realized that no media was willing to do it. So probably if I was working for the Associated Press or Reuters or BBC, they would just not do it because they, have, they haven't done it. So there are pros and cons, of course. But at the same time, uh, there are um, pros uh, which are um, being able to pay for lawyers, which is really important when you do investigative journalism, because the first thing they do is to attack you legally, so you have to be able to pay for lawyers or to pay for compensation in case you lose. And you have to have this big legal department able to support you. So it's really important that when you work as an investigative journalist, even if you work for a small organization, but you have to be very careful about the fact that they have to a, a good legal department because that's crucial for an investigative journalist. They can be small, they can be a small organization, but they have to have a very good legal department, very good lawyers because that's crucial. Otherwise, you cannot do it good proper investigative journalism. This is my experience. I have worked on the investigative journalism since 2006, which means 14 years. And uh, you know, uh, uh, what but, but Stefania, was... maybe you should explain. I mean, I know you very well. I know you don't love lawyers. It has to do with the threats that are coming. I think you should explain that a little bit. Why you need the lawyers? Well, uh, let me mention one of my investigation back in two thousand nine. Uh, so I had this uh, garment factory uh, who, which was an Italian one, but it was operating in Karachi, in Pakistan. So, for example, I spent one year just investigating what they were doing to local uh, poor and local uh, workers, employees, horrific things. And, uh, of course, the, lo the local um, uh, people didn't want to talk to me and they were not able to uh, to talk to me because they were uh, speaking a very local dialect, Balochi and Sindhi and so on. So I basically uh, asked for help to local organizations working on uh, workers' rights. Uh, I asked for help to local organizations working on uh, uh, environmental problems and so on. I spent one year investigating this case. And at the end, uh, the investigation was really, really good. We published, and I spent the, the basically six years defending myself uh, legally because they did all sorts of appeal. They filed a, a libel against me and my editors, and they uh, we spent a lot of money and just to bring witnesses from Pakistan and just to have them in the court with the translators. And, uh, you know, we spent six years just to defend ourselves. And everything was uh, properly done. Uh, we won 
we won all the Liga cases. So, but I was able to do this, spending tens of thousands of euros uh, just for the legal cost because we had a very good legal department. So even if you don't work for the New York Times, even if you don't work for the Reuters, but you work for a smaller organization, you still need to be very careful about having a, a very good legal department because that's crucial for an investigative journalist. That's absolutely crucial. And they know how to uh, to make this uh, litigation more and more expensive for years, filing the legal, uh, the criminal complaint, the li libel cases in the most expensive districts. So that is very, very expensive for the journalists. They know how to exploit uh, politically uh, sensitive districts for their litigation. So it's very, very. Uh, heavy work, uh, and you have to be able to to pay tens of thousands of euros in this work. That's why it's crucial to have a media organization with very with a very good legal department. For my experience. So would that then also in return mean that obviously if you if you operate a smaller platform, still doesn't mean that it's less quality, but simply because of the investments that are especially related to legal cases, what you are just referring to, is much, much harder for smaller platforms to obviously support the investigative journalist? I think so. based on my experience, yes. That the problem is not with the quality of journalism. Sometimes they offer very good quality of journalism. The problem is getting the resources to protect yourself, legally speaking. I mean, in my case, with that investigation about the garment factory, they intimidated every single blogger and the bloggers removed and the small um, journalistic um, um, entities just removed from their websites uh, my investigation, whereas my newspaper which was basically able to sustain the legal costs, didn't remove it at all. And we won the case. After seven years, we won the case. We never remove our investigation, whereas the small platform, they just get, got rid as soon as they got the legal threats, you know? I mean, it remains important to check out, uh, even with the big, the small, or whatever platforms where the money is coming from, not all of the new platforms out there are really as neutral and um, maybe in the same line of interest as you would think as a critical journalist. So, yeah, there's some warnings to be spoken out here. Yeah. yeah, so coming to the last question, and that is maybe a nice next step referred to or compared to the previous question, um, and this one now is. Do you think that the media today are not covering the Assange case in a much more larger scale because they're afraid? For example, is the treatment of Assange in this sense already successful or are there any other reasons? What's your take? Okay. You want to start? Yes. <laughs> I don't think it is a matter of them being uh, you know, scared at all. I don't think they don't want to do it just because of it is not politically, you know, it doesn't pay well, politically speaking. Uh, they they know that this kind of support for Julian Assange doesn't gain you powerful friends. Quite the opposite. It, it gains you powerful enemies. And these people don't want to lose their good relationship, don't want to damage the good relationships with the State Department, with the White House, with the CIA, with the, all these establishments, uh, which is really important. So I think this is one of the reasons. And that's why I, I invite whistleblowers and sources to be careful about these dynamics, you know? Re just have a look on it and realize that if you rely on a journalist, if you contact a journalist, it should be a decent one. It should be one who is siding with Julian Assange in this terrible situation. They are crashing him and they have been so doing so for the last 10 years. 
and what they have done to him is completely unacceptable. And we published the very same documents and never got arrested, never got put in prison, never got even questioned. But they crushed him, they put him in prison, they uh, tortured him psychologically, and this is not my opinion. This is the uh, opinion of the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, so it's not my judgment, I mean. So you have to be very careful who you are contacting, because if you are contacting a journalist who just make a lot of profit out of this coup, and then kept silent about this horrific treatment, probably he will treat you in the same way as a source. He will get scooped and then just be silent and do absolutely nothing about you, which is completely uh, uh, indecent, I believe, completely unacceptable, both professionally speaking and ethically speaking. Andy. Yes. Um, I mean, coming back to the question, um, of course, what happened to Julian is that um, as he was like the key person building up WikiLeaks, that he has provided some attack surface that has been used in such a massive way that he has become almost a non-person. I mean, it was all about his, you know, um, alleged rape thing. It was about the... Uh, his behavior, it was about this and that. It was no more about his role as a journalist. And now people realize, oh, he's not sitting in jail because um, of his behavior or whatever. He's sitting there because of his work. And that's what they were after. But the desolidarization has taken such an effect that it has taken quite a while and some policemen to carry him out of an embassy for people to realize what this is about. And of course, the hundreds of pages that we're facing here in the lawsuit from the US side, the response of the defense and all that ongoing shit show in that court case that the British government tries also to keep as intransparent as possible, at least how they treat him. So um, I find this um, a very heavy struggle, but I do have some hopes that people get the memo. And I think many people do intuitively understand, uh, and that's also what they want. They want this intimidation. They want this, you know, we'll deal, we'll, we'll hang him at the highest tree and so on. Um, and um, I think journalists have two elements of struggling. And the one element is really to say, hey, wait a moment, um, this guy has been unfairly treated even by the media. And secondly, this is about the the future of journalism. And the second point, I think we're getting there. The first point is also becoming slightly better. But um, there is also this difficult transition period right now where everybody's talking Trump versus Biden. For me, the most dangerous man out there seems to be Pompeo. And um, I'm not really sure that Trump is a driving force there. Pompeo for sure is. But I will talk about that in my talk when I finally can do it with the slides um, at a later point. I just want to add one thing. Uh, what makes me hopeful is the fact that more and more people realize that Julian is in this situation because of his work. And uh, it has been so from the very beginning. And even uh, The Guardian and other newspaper could have easily discovered this, just filing their freedom of information request and discovering how their their authorities were telling the the Swedish yeah, they could have done it but they didn't do it exactly they could have done it from the very beginning and but they why could didn't have, they they didn't of course why they didn't. not why not why not well that's an interesting question that's an interesting question and I, and I think this is what the last question refers to have they been too afraid. Well, I don't think that you are afraid to file a freedom of information request. I mean, that but is... If you, but if you see the Guardian guys going in the basement of their building, taking these um, grinders and dealing with their own hard disk, being watched by UK government, MI6 or whatever it was, guys, to destroy their, Snowden, their own Snowden material, I mean, holy fuck, this is not how I imagine free journalism or free media to act. There's something terribly wrong there. 
in that scenario. I agree. At the same time, they, uh, I agree. I would have never destroyed, really. I would have never accepted anything like that. I, if, you, if ever, I if I ever have such an experience of the secret services threatening me and uh, asking me to destroy it, I would, I would just say, look, I will make you appear like. Uh, you know, China or Putin, Russia or uh, maybe North Korea, I, I won't destroy them. I will, you can do whatever you want, but I will make a fuss, I will make a big scandal, I will never destroy it. But in the case of the, but you know, in that case, they were under kind of threat, I would say. They would, but in the case of the freedom of information request, they could have filed them. There was no, no legal risk, no risk whatsoever. I mean, it was very, it, it didn't require a lot of resources. It's just, it was just about filing a freedom of information request. So that's maybe, why... they, maybe they were threatened with things we don't know. Of course, that's, that's possible. I don't exclude such. But I think, but... I think there is much more, I mean, I think it's a, uh, a more likely scenario is that they just, I mean, it's uh, about how journalism is in these days. You know, <laughs> I think it's uh, something even more serious than the threats by the uh, national security complex. It's all about these superficialities, it's all about this. You have to realize, for example, that we have, uh, during the Julian Assange hearing, one of the most important media uh, outlets, uh, the Columbia Journalism Review, published an article uh, with some very unreliable information about Julian, saying that Julian was charged in Sweden, which is, I mean, which is one of the very clear things he, he never was. I mean, there are press releases by the Swedish prosecutors telling that that was that those were just allegations were never charges well i contacted them they refused to amend their article and this is why i think it's much more about how journalism is done is conducted in these days it's all about superficiality and the sensationalistic uh, approach that's why i think it's, it's much more dangerous because if you have threats from the national security a complex. Uh, well, at least I can understand you. You are scared, but in this case, it's even more serious. It's a, it's a brain dead journalism. I'm afraid to say it. It's uh, you know dead journalism. You know that's very something very serious. I mean, uh, how can you accept that the new journalist tried to access the the documents about this case when hundreds of journalists have reported on it? Hundreds of journalists have, have reported on this case. So why not to ask the documents? It's the very basic, very basic. I mean, when I was asking about this case to the colleagues, it was a, a real nightmare. I was asking, look, what it means, uh, this, uh, this Swedish case? And they, they were unable to, to reply to very basic question. It was chaos. No one had the facts right. So how can you work in this mess? I cannot work in this mess. You know, I cannot work. I need facts. I need, I need very clear, logical, you know, uh, very, you know, rigorous approach to facts and to understand what is actually going on and to have solid journalism. And I wonder why these people haven't tried. You know, for me, it's a... Uh, is, is a big failure, huge failure of journalism. So I think it is even more serious that uh, getting threats from the national security complex, because in that case, you can, we are human, you know, we have fear, you know, it's pretty common. Uh, we have fear of the mafias, we have fear of the intelligence services, uh, we, are, we fear the threats and so on. But in this case, it was even worse. It was about superficiality, lack of a rigorous approach. I would say that journalism, it's uh, something, 
I would call that way, you know. I have nothing to add. That was very beautifully summarized. Thank you. <laughs> wow, we've got five minutes left. Um, no more questions. I can only say on behalf of the entire R3S team, thank you so much for your time, for the amazing information you shared. Sometimes a bit scary. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a sleepless night tonight because my brain will keep spinning in a good sense. Anyway, uh, as I said beforehand, five minutes left. Any famous last words from you guys? Well... No. Well, I, I have. No, I mean, we, we need a. You, yeah. of course, need to come with a strategy how how we deal with the brain dead guys. I mean, uh, with the lazy, um, you know, uh, journalists in the game. How do we get them back into thinking, or at least um, get them moved out to dealing with horses or sheep or whatever, uh, so that others can take over the journalistic, critical, um, and investigative job. Well, I think you have to force them to be uh, rigorous and precise. So when they publish unreliable, false information, you should challenge them and say, look, you have to amend the article. I don't want to uh, file a libel case against you because I don't, I don't believe in this uh, libel machine. At the same time, I want to have you getting the fa uh, fact right, straight. So you should keep the record straight. And I ask you to amend the article, and you should do it. Otherwise, I go ahead with a libel case. I think that's an important thing to do because it will have them looking at the article and getting the facts right and uh, keeping online well, but, but reliable one, information. I, I like your idea, Stefania, but what I have experienced with some journalists inside entities as they told me yes they wanted to include you know the facts the sources the names but their editor has said the policy is no more than three names per page because it confuses the people they can't deal with the complexity and so on journalism has also changed with the way uh, media products are consumed so my question is how can we bring back also the more fact based or at least optional naming of sources, you know, the, the references, how you would find it in any scientific word where you say, this sentence is nothing without not the, the mentioning of the source. So how can I check it and so on? So uh, how do we deal with this, you know, simplification for entertainment and for easy consumption reason versus um, a way to, to really write things that you can verify and understand them? This is a, a, a very important question, of course, and uh, I cannot address in a few seconds <laughs> because uh, we have very little, but that's a crucial question. How can we make, uh, how can we publish information which is verifiable by our readers so the trust is established and you cannot trust, and you can trust that publication and that article. That's a, a huge fact, and uh, I think we have to address it because in these days, it's, uh, I mean, we are far from those days where the journalists published and nothing happened. In these days, you have people on the social network telling you, you wrote uh, bad things, it's completely wrong, you got the story completely wrong. And unless you are able to keep your reporting and your investigative journalism credible and solid, you lose your uh, reputation, which is everything for a journalist. So that's a, a very important matter to discuss, but we cannot do it in a few minutes, of course. Well, if you can do it in 10, we've still got some more time left until the next talk is on. Fortunately, our uh, technology is running stable and does not kind of uh, give okay. us a headache. So if, okay, if, if, you, if you want to add a few more words to, to this important question, uh, please go ahead. Stefania, I think, I mean, technology-wise, um, of course, uh, in the internet, you can easily link to sources and so on. Yeah. It's much more easy than in print. And there's also not the argument of the space or whatever. Um, the argument often seems to be the simplification of the message versus the complexity of the whole story or whatever. And um, so this is maybe this does require also 
an, an attitude change in the chief editors of this planet to always think, oh, you know, we can't bring all this complexity to our readers. They need it simple and slight and as easy to eat up like a sandwich and the, the anti-advertisement break that goes hand in hand with it. So I'm wondering what's the mentality that, that provides someone trying out to bring out um, a media format. I mean, some, some uh, outlets and, and some uh, entities, some media projects do that. They do link more sources and so on. But it seems to be also the fear to be, uh, to be appearing not like the unique, great source and the only place of the universe where the truth is written, but just one place that is well networked. I don't know what's the fear there, but there must be, maybe you can talk about that that mentality that seems to be also an issue, not only with the journalist itself, but the environment they work in. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I agree with you. I mean, they don't want to address this complexity. They want uh, as smooth as possible, and then there are the legal concern and all sorts of problems. Uh, I know, the, but at the same time, we have to find a way to make this, uh, I mean, this information completely verifiable. And, uh, you know, you. I, I think one of the important things is uh, to be open to the feedback. So in this case, when I was contacting the Columbia Journalism review and they were not accepting to amend their article when in fact they got the the story wrong about the swedish case that was un, completely unacceptable to me i mean i'm telling you that i'm qualified i, I have worked five years i'm bringing you original sources i'm bringing you the press releases by the swedish prosecutors tell mentioning allegations rather than charges do you believe that the Swedish prosecutors are telling lies about the, the fact that they were they had no charges but rather allegation? It's unbelievable if you believe so. I mean, that's completely unacceptable. So you, sometimes you have these editors who are, you know, open to criticism. They are smart enough to address people challenging them. And that's good. Other times you have these uh, editors which are completely, uh, you know, hostile to this kind of approach, and they they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to address uh, uh, criticism or any kind of feedback. That's very annoying. That's completely unacceptable because, I, and I believe it's a very stupid approach because if you you know, if you are happy about it, you have, if you are convinced you have done a good job, you are verified, you have a solid fact-checking, fact you should be willing to engage with people challenging you. That's kind of corroboration process. So it's, uh, I, I really cannot tolerate such approach. And they, they should realize that the, in these days, this will happen more and more because, uh, as I said, you have people challenging you on platforms, on social networks, and so on. So you should engage with them. Uh, of course, uh, if they criticize you respectfully, I'm not saying you should engage with people uh, offending you and so on, but you should engage with people who politely and respectfully challenge you and bring you facts. I mean, that's... That's crucial. I mean, that's the difference between real journalism, honest journalism, and propaganda and bad faith in journalism, you know? Makes sense to me. And obviously an audience who is reading your articles, who's reading your content, who's listening to what you have to say, and then supporting all those journos who really take their job seriously, obviously. Well, the only thing I can say is grazie mille. Thank you very oh, much. You. Vielen Dank. It was really great thank to you. have you. Thank you for the super valuable information you shared. Really excited and um, looking forward to hearing more. Thank you thank so you. much for Thanks being with so us. Much. Buona serata. Okay. Buona serata. Right. Good night, Stefania.